I have never backed this many inverts into a single tank before. And I'm not just talking about snails and hermit crabs. I was browsing the Seahorse Savvy website looking for some new Seahorse tank mates when I had this idea. How could you build an entire system based around keeping alive some of the most tricky inverts like sponges, cucumbers, and scallops? How do you keep the water dirty enough on one hand for all the filter feeders while not having crazy high nutrient levels and rampant nuisance algae growth? Matthew here, your BRS beginner guru, and today I'm gonna show you how to build a tank to showcase some of the coolest invertebrates out there. I hopped on the phone with Alyssa at Seahorse Savvy to work out the details. A lot of you may not know this, but Seahorse Savvy is my go-to for gorgonians, macro, algae, and invertebrates. I don't know how they do it, but they stock the widest variety of inverts I've seen. And since I'm no livestock expert, I needed some advice. We'll get to the crazy stock list later in this video, but my goal was to have the widest selection of unique invertebrates possible and to build them an ecosystem, not only where they could thrive, but where they could also be on display. Moving on to the gear, we're using the Innovative Marine 40 gallon all-in-one system with the matching white APS stand. If you want details on how to set this tank up, there's a link to that video in the description below. In the rear filtration chamber, we're using a filter sock on the left and the custom acrylic caddy on the right. We're using the 150 watt ultra heater from Aqua L plugged into an Inkbird temperature controller. We've paired the Reef Breeders Prism Auto Top Off unit with the five gallon Innovative Marine Hydrofill Reservoir to simplify evaporation top off. For sand, we've gone with our favorite special grade from Carib Sea, and our Aquascape is a mix of Marco Rocks and Carib Sea Life Rock. We're using a Vortec MP10 for flow and a Reef Octopus Classic 1000 Hang on the Back Protein Skimmer. We DIY'd a small macroalgae refugium using a Lee's specimen container and are using the Flipper Float for algae control. We've got the Ecotech Radeon G6 Pro light fixture with the RMS mount. And lastly, we're using an Amazon Wi-Fi strip as our pseudo aquarium controller. For this build, we went with between 10 and 20 pounds of Arig Alive special grain sand from Carib Sea. We went with a pretty shallow one inch sand bed spread equally throughout the tank. That will give our sand dwelling invertebrates just enough space to feel safe while not too deep to create a detritus trap. This sand was actually already in this tank from a previous build and amazingly clean because I had a hyperactive sand sifting goby in there. If I hadn't already had this pre-cycle sand bed, I would have actually gone with a different sand. A 20 pound bag of Ocean Direct original grade sand is pulled directly from the ocean and packed with seawater. So it's filled with a super diverse amount of bacteria that will not only help cycle your tank faster, but also provide a much greater biodiversity as Ryan showed in his biome series. Because you're gonna want moderate flow to bring nutrients to all those filter feeders, make sure you use a sand other than and oolite or sugar fine sand as we call it in the hobby. The incredibly small 0.25 millimeter grain size of oolite sand will blow around your tank and maybe even cause damage to your filter feeders. I'd recommend special grade, original grade, Fiji pink, or Bimini pink. And if you go with the Ocean Direct or the Arig Alive line from Carib Sea, remember don't rinse the sand or you'll be destroying all the beneficial bacteria it comes with. Normally Marco rocks combined with Carib Sea life rocks wouldn't look very good together because one starts off purple and the other starts off white. But I've been using these same Marco rocks for months in a different tank already and they're covered with coralline algae, sponges, and small tube worms. And by adding a couple pieces of Carib Sea Life Rock, including a small arch, I was able to get a bit more depth and diversity in the aquascape. I had two competing goals for this aquascape. The first was to provide as much mounting space as possible for different corals and invertebrates, while at the same time maximizing my viewing pleasure. The second goal was kind of the exact opposite of the first. I wanted to provide at least one large area that was hidden and cave-like that the inverts could escape to to feel safe. Even though I selfishly want to see all of the inverts all of the time, I know from experience that they need a place to be able to hide to feel safe. Otherwise, they'll become stressed and die. 
But that being said, I didn't want to create too many hiding spaces, so here's what I did. On the right hand side, I took three pieces of Marco rocks and leaned them together vertically, kind of like you would when assembling some sort of teepee tent. There's a large opening on the side that creates a dark interior cave for livestock to enter. These pieces fit really well together without glue or epoxy, but if you do something similar, you may want to secure them together because there are going to be many bulldozers in your tank, including many snails and conks. On the left side, I used another piece of Marco rocks for the base and then a Carib Sea arch to create a swim through. The arch will also give me a lot of space for mounting coral. I of course left room on all four sides of the aquascape for flow and to fit an algae scraper, but also space down the middle for visual appeal and to be able to collect detritus if it happens to collect there. I filled the tank up with some freshly made Tropic Marin Pro reef salt and added a few different sized empty shells for future hermit crabs. Luckily, since this sand was from a previous system with the sand sifting goby, after I added the water, it was already pretty clear. But I did add a filter sock to the left side and some fiber filter balls to the right side on the top portion of the Innovative Marine Custom Acrylic Caddy. Next, I added the Wave Maker, and this time around I went with the Vortec MP10, which is a perfect size for the system. I mounted it in the middle of the left side panel in the top quarter of the tank. Since I already used the Mobius app, I just needed to add the pump and choose the setting. I went with the Tidal Swell preset set to low, and then turn down to 25%. After I get all the livestock in, I may turn the output of the pump up quite a bit, depending on the needs of the coral and how much detritus, fish food, and waste is settling to the bottom. This should give me a nice clockwise flow pattern and help keep detritus suspended, especially in the front and rear portion of the tank. But I will have to watch out on the sides and the center for fish food and waste build up over time. From the get go, I knew I would need a protein skimmer for this tank. Not only was I going to pack it to the brim with livestock, but I would need to feed heavily to keep the filter feeders alive. I can't dump in a copious amount of phytoplankton, oyster feast, rotifers, mysis, pellets, and coral food without a robust method for removing all of the extra food. So I went with the Reef Octopus Classic 1000 hang on the back skimmer that is rated for a heavily stocked 55 gallon tank. I've actually used this one before and after the break-in period, it's an absolute beast. If it's your first time setting this skimmer up, I'm not gonna lie to you, the directions are not very good, but there is a video on exactly how to do it and we'll put a link in the description below. Next, I DIY'd a mini in-tank refugium. I just took a small specimen container, drilled some holes, then added some miracle mud to the bottom and put some ketomorph on top. I know it's overkill and probably not going to export a lot of nutrients due to its small size, but it fits perfectly right next to the protein skimmer, which is pretty much taking up all the viewing space on that right panel anyway, so I figured why not. If you're not careful, it's really easy to crack and break these specimen containers during drilling. So check out a video I made all about in-tank refugiums for a few tips and tricks, and we'll put a link in the description below. I like to run activated carbon on all of my systems, all the time pretty much. That is unless, of course, I'm running an ozone generator, but since I'm not doing that for this system, I added a baggie of Bulk Reef Supply ROX 0.8 activated carbon to the Innovative Marine Custom Caddy. I also added a baggie of BRS high capacity GFO to the Innovative Marine Caddy as well. Even though I know I'm jumping the gun a bit, there is still some leftover food waste in the sand bed. And since I will be adding the livestock the next day, I know I'm gonna need it and need it fast. Any properly sized heater will work just fine for this tank. I'm keeping my water temperature the usual 77 to 78 degrees and I like the slim profile of the Aqua L Ultra Heater. Unless you keep your home really cool, the 150 watt version is the perfect size. The heater itself is actually set to 80 degrees, but I have it connected to an Inkbird temperature controller. The controller is set to 77 degrees with a variance of plus or minus 0.5 degrees, meaning it keeps the temperature between 76.5 and 77.5 degrees Fahrenheit. 
I have the heater in the right compartment in the rear filtration chamber and the temperature probe in the left compartment in the rear filtration chamber. That way I know I'm actually measuring the tank water temperature and not just the water temperature in the compartment near the heater. For all-in-one style systems with that rear filtration chamber, I'm a huge fan of the Reef Breeders Prism Auto Top Off Unit. They come with three optical sensors for added redundancy and the unit itself is really small. Plus they come with a tiny and quiet DC pump with a whopping eight feet of head pressure. I have the Prism ATO sensor in the middle compartment and set to keep the water height just below the baffles. And instead of a five gallon bucket, which would work completely fine, mind you, I'm using this super fancy and awesome innovative marine five gallon hydrofill reservoir. It fits perfectly in the stand, has a place in the back to hide the wires, and has a pull-out refilling drawer to easily add RODI water. And the last piece of gear we need to set up are the lights. These are the Radeon XR15 Pros with the RMS mount. The light sits eight inches above the water surface and perfectly fits the dimensions of the tank. I needed to program the light to provide adequate PAR and spectrum for LPS coral. So we're looking at a PAR range of between 50 and 125 throughout the entire system. I also wanted the spectrum and schedule to match my water box frag tank schedule. That way when I need to move corals and inverts back and forth between the tanks, I'll reduce reduce their stress because the lighting schedule will be the same. I use the exact same schedule on all of my tanks, but I adjust the Kelvin to suit my visual preferences and the overall intensity to either raise or lower the PAR levels depending on what livestock I have inside. I made an entire video on how to program these lights, so for much greater detail, check out the link in the description below. But here's the quick overview of my light settings. Sunrise at 7 a.m. with a ramp until 9.50 a.m. at 50% intensity and 20,000 degrees Kelvin. A quick ramp to full intensity at 10.36 a.m with 100% intensity at 15,000 degrees Kelvin. Full intensity until 4.40 p.m., then we begin a quick ramp down to 5.05 p.m. at 50% intensity and 20,000 degrees Kelvin, then a slow ramp down to full off at 8 p.m. And then I have that overall program running at 75%. Okay, I think that's finally all of the gear, and if you stuck around with me this long, we're finally ready to add livestock to the tank. The vast majority of fish, gorgonians, macroalgae, and non-coral inverts were provided by Seahorse Savvy. The owner, Alyssa, is well known in this hobby for breeding seahorses. But what a lot of people don't realize is she sells a ton of other stuff that you can't find anywhere else. Everything she sells is, of course, seahorse safe, but you don't need to have seahorses to appreciate seahorse savvy. Alyssa is so good and passionate at what she does that she actually won the 2022 Masna Aquarius of the Year Award, meaning she's definitely for real. Anytime I need inverts, macro, algae, or gorgonians, I head to the Seahorse Savvy website and browse their selection. Once everything arrived, as per Seahorse Savvy instructions, I temperature acclimated everything for at least 30 minutes before adding them to my tank. I also turned off all the lights in the room and the aquarium lights before opening the box to reduce stress. Since my goal was to show off invertebrates, I only got two types of fish from Seahorse Savvy. The first was a saltwater condition tangerine albino molly. A great algae eater, super friendly, readily eats prepared foods, and hangs out all day in the water column. But the coolest fish Alyssa sent me were actually a school of nine aquarium condition mast gobies. These fish are prophylactically treated and quarantined before being shipped out. They are super small, reaching only one to two inches at full size and have fun personalities. They're peaceful and showcase shoaling behavior, which is really cool to watch. And then on top of all of those fish, just to add a little bit more pizzazz to the system, I moved over a single pajama cardinal and a sustainable aquatics percula clownfish. Moving on to corals, I peppered the aquascape with a whole bunch of beauties from my water box frag tank. I added some gorgeous euphelia from worldwide corals, including frog spawn, octo spawn, 
and several different colorations of hammer coral. I made a little Euphelia garden road on top of the arch where they would all get plenty of light and plenty of flow. A fellow local reefer here in the Coachella Valley, a friend named Cole, gave me this red Acropora frag as well as this plating Montipora. I added three candy cane corals from my buddy Darren at Rogue Aquariums and one toadstool and mushroom also from Worldwide Coral. I didn't do anything special with the coral placement other than mix up the different species and spread the colors out. I use the tried and true super glue, epoxy, super glue method to attach the coral to the aquascape. Now moving on to the meat and pudding portion of this video, the entire reason I even created this video, the invertebrates. In no particular order, here are all of the invertebrates I put in this IM40 tank, all of which are from Seahorse Savvy. Three orange ruffle sponges, each three to four inches in size. One of the hardier sponge species, keep them completely submerged at all times. Make sure algae doesn't grow on them, so a low light and high flow area is ideal. Next up, we have three yellow ball sponges, two to two and a half inches in size. Pretty much the same recommendations as the ruffle sponge, although the yellow ball sponge is considered encrusting. Now onto the brightly colored neon orange Luzon starfish. Not as common in our hobby, the Luzon starfish likes to reside on the rock work or sand bed. Moving on to the three lettuce nudibranch, they're good size with some eye-catching frills. They'll cruise around your aquarium grazing on algae. Now let's talk about these two giraffe serpent starfish one of which is a solid color and the other known as a print. That looks exactly like a giraffe, mind you, hence the name. These brittle stars are not only super cool looking, they are also great cleanup crew members. Typically residing in the sand bed or under rocks, you'll likely get the best view during feeding time. Let's talk about these two beauties next, the green and blue porcelain crab. While the blue one may look a bit fancier, these are hardy scavengers with really cool feathery mouthpieces for pulling small bits of food out of the water column. Of course, I also picked up several emerald crabs because I have a bit of a bubble algae problem in some of my tanks. Oh, <laughs> wait until you see these conks. The standard fighting conch, the strawberry conch, and the super fancy hawk wing conch. These sand bed dwelling omnivores will graze on algae and hunt down leftover food from the bottom of the tank. Next up, we have a whole bunch of different snails. These small bumblebee snails are great detritivores and their small size means they can get into tight spaces. Next up are these similarly sized lightning dove snails, also small in size. These are great algae eaters. This is the uniquely shaped algae eating star Astrea snail. All that you love about Astrea snails in a cool star shape. I always add these zombie-like Nasaria snails to my tanks. Their little elephant-like trunk sticks out of the sand, and the moment you feed the tank, they arise from the grave and hunt down the meaty food. And lastly are the zebra nerite snails. Nice and small, another great algae eater. Okay, now we've got five super cool scallops to show you. Scallops are peaceful filter feeders that need lots of phytoplankton and other small foods to thrive in an aquarium setting. Scallops swim using jet propulsion and are fun to watch. Place them where you will, they will move around until they find their preferred home. These large flame scallops have these long red tentacles and have up to 200 eyes. The much smaller colored knobby scallops may not be as big and showy as the flame scallops, but the really cool shell shape makes them a great addition to your tank. We've got a good selection of hermit crabs, the scarlet, the polka dot, and the stocky orange claw. The smaller scarlet hermit crabs are great detritivores and can crawl into some pretty tight spaces in your rock work, while the larger polka dot and stocky orange claw will eat lots of algae. Since I'm not going to add a messy sand sifting goby to this tank, I needed a more robust approach to filtering the sand bed. Enter the Pacific Sand Sifting Starfish. Two to three inches in size, these detritivores are fantastic sand dwelling scavengers that will come out and seemingly float across your tank hunting down some chow. This next one's a first for me. 
a dwarf cowrie. Yes, they are also snails, but their glassy shells are stunning and set them above the rest. Algae eaters, they will graze all day long on the glass and rockwork. No invertebrate tank would be complete without a couple of skunk cleaner shrimp. Super friendly, you'll often find these little helpers pulling parasites off fish. They'll pretty much eat anything you put in the tank and have been known to jump onto your hand for a little cleaning time. It's a bit tickly, but it's fun. I love this red and gold feather duster worm. These filter feeders have a large crown that filters out phytoplankton all day long. Place them in the rock work and their soft body will attach itself eventually. Next up, we have a couple pink footed cucumbers. Super fun to watch. These filter feeders have feathery tentacles that grab food from the water column and then insert the entire tentacle into their mouth. Sea cucumbers aren't picky. We'll pick a spot to settle into on your rock work and go to town filtering your water. And the final item we received from Seahorse Savvy was a pistol shrimp. These shrimp can form a cool symbiotic relationship with several species of gobies, whereby they share a burrow together. The pistol shrimp will eat all sorts of meaty foods and will create a burrow underneath your rock work. The last invert I added was a pincushion sea urchin from Algae Barn a fantastic algae eater. It will scour your rock work and glass for algae. Sometimes they also like to take snails and hermit crabs for a free ride, although I don't think they appreciate it very much. Okay, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but we are not done with the livestock yet. I added a few Gorgonians to the top of the aquascape to give some more height to the system. I then added a few different species of macroalgae to the sand bed. Not only pleasant to look at, they will also help uptake nitrate and phosphate in this heavily fed tank. I always start new tanks with a couple of bottles of copepods from Algae Barn, and this time I went with ecopods. They are a great food source for much of the livestock, but also tremendous cleanup crew members. They can also help avoid the ugly stage entirely in new systems because they will consume a ton of diatoms. It's pretty obvious to see by now that I added a ton of livestock to this tank. In fact, for all of you beginners out there, do not add nearly as much as I just did. I wanted to showcase some amazing inverts that are out there, but I also have several other tanks that I can move these inverts to if it ends up being too much for this system. I have tried to keep scallops and sponges long term with little success. I believe the reason was underfeeding. I know we talk a lot in this hobby about overfeeding, but filter feeding invertebrates need a constant supply of food to thrive in your tank. And because of the variety of livestock in this system, there are several different kinds of food that need to be added daily. I'm heavily feeding the system two times each day. I turn off the protein skimmer and return pump for 30 minutes during feeding so that the food stays in the water column for a good amount of time so that I don't forget to turn the return pumps and the skimmer back on. I use the smart Wi-Fi strip to set timers. For the filter feeders, I feed a mix of foods. Phytoplankton is primary and is fed two times a day. I also feed Tigger Feast, Rata Feast, and Oyster Feast from Reef Nutrition. These help balance out the diet for all the different filter feeders and coral. For the algae eaters, I add Hikari algae wafers once a day. I also add a piece of dried seaweed, nori, once a day. I also feed Hikari seaweed extreme pellets daily, especially for the molly. For the fish and other carnivores in the tank, I feed a wide variety of different foods, not all at the same time, mind you. For pellets, I feed TDO Chroma Boost, PE pellets, and Sustainable Aquatics Hatchery Diet, all of which are small enough for the mast gobies to eat. I feed Reef Nutrition Real Oceanic Eggs, or Roe, which everybody seems to gobble up. I also feed Mysis Shrimp, whether it's Frozen Hikari, PE Freshwater Gut Loaded Mysis, or Aquaforest Liquid Mysis. This is a ton of food, and I don't feed it all at once, but the trick to feeding this system is to make sure that everything gets what they need every single day. On top of all this food, I'm also dosing three things daily. The first is Kalkwasser. I've started with two teaspoons added to the five gallon Innovative Marine Hydrofill Reservoir, and will adjust as needed to keep my DKH between eight and nine. The second thing I dose daily is Brightwell Aquatics Cato Grow. I've really struggled with certain species of macroalgae, such as rooted mermaid fans, rooted shaving brush, 
rooted pine cones, and rooted halameda. Alyssa at Seahorse Savvy told me that they've been finding a lot of success using Brightwell Aquatics Cato Grow, so I'm gonna give it a shot. The last thing I dose daily is Red Seas Reef Energy AB+. I've used it for years now in all of my systems that have coral. I don't think it will be possible to feed this tank heavily without doing large weekly water changes. I could be wrong and only frequent water testing will prove this out. This system took a lot of planning and effort to put together. And because of all of the inverts, there will be various macro algaes and sponges that will be knocked over from time to time. So you're gonna have to get your hand in there and put them back occasionally. We don't often think of building a tank to showcase unique inverts but in fact, it can be highly satisfying and something cool to show off to your mates. The Innovative Marine 40 is a great tank for all sorts of builds, so click here to check out all of the other things we've done with it. And as always, everyone, thanks for watching. Happy reefing. Be well. We'll see you next time.